already we're pretty constrained in fresh water. We in California are experiencing this firsthand right now. And so another application of being able to have lots of energy is to be able to create fresh water from ocean water. Every drop of drinking water on the plant is desalinated with nuclear power today. I think we should just use a little bit more. And everybody on the planet has all the fresh water they can drink. Put a power plant on the coast, bring in seawater from a couple miles out, desalinate it. You know, suddenly you're not even pulling water out of the aquifers anymore. So the river's not touched, the lake's not touched. I must be missing something. These guys who are real nuclear engineers, they must know something about nuclear that will, if I knew it, then I would understand why we're not doing molten salt reactors. So, I need to go get my degree and get an understanding, and then I'll, I'll see what it, whatever it is they see. Turns out everything I learned, everything I studied, just made this look better and better. And these, these are kind of arcane reasons, but they're very important. Like one day I learned how the reactor would always homogenize its composition. That may not sound like a big deal, but to a reactor designer, that's a humongous deal. It is just absolutely of incredible performance. I'm sitting here thinking, you guys should build this machine if you only picked one reason. It should be for that reason, because it would make it so much easier for you to design and operate the reactor. And I brought it up to my professor. He was talking about how the you know, current reactors work. I said, well, did you realize this design would always have a homogenous composition? He goes, I never thought about that. From uh, cyberspace, from Kirk Sorensen, who is with the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, he would like for you to comment on the molten salt reactor program. The molten salt people, uh, who included uh, the most famous figures in, in nuclear energy, in particular Eugene Wigner, uh, are all dying off. We don't have people building molten salt reactors now. The uh, molten salt reactor experiment was one of the most important and, and I must say brilliant achievements of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I hope that after I'm gone, people will look at the dusty books that were written on molten salts and will say, hey, these guys had a pretty good idea. Let's go back to it. Once you learn something, you know, you can't pretend you didn't learn it, and you can't pretend that you don't know what a powerful thing this is. And you can choose to do that, but that's not the moral choice to make, right? To ignore it, to pretend you didn't learn it. So the moral thing, the right thing to do, is to just do what we're doing, which is, in my opinion, it's sort of the bare minimum. Well, you know, I've been in this energy game for about a, 10 years now, and no one's ever told me there was a safer, you know, more sustainable form of nuclear. So I was kind of inst instantly interested. And, um, and I kept thinking about it occasionally. I kept in touch with Kirk a little bit. And then Fukushima happened. This is great. I mean, this is just what I wanted to have happen, is her talking to, to these guys and, and getting that straight up. Oh man, it's just perfect. Nick Engel's probably the most knowledgeable person around these days, right? I've never met Sid. I've read all his papers. I've actually extracted all the text from him, converted it all, rebuilt. I mean, I have, I have, I don't know if there's anybody that studied his stuff more than me. I was so tickled when I found out he was alive. I mean, how do you feel about the reactor now? I mean, it sounds like it was quite a, a boring job in a way, but did you feel fondly towards this reactor oh, design? Oh, yes. It yeah. wasn't at all boring. Well, I mean, boring in the sense that, you know, it, you, it was quite safe. <laughs> and, uh, it did exactly what we calculated it ought to do, mm. and that's pretty satisfying. Oh, yeah. I think it would unleash a lot of human potential that's currently not being fully ful fulfilled. Standards of living does correlate quite well with access to energy. Throughout her life, she had been heating water with firewood, and she had hand-washed laundry for seven children. And now she was going to watch electricity do that work. There's a great talk on TED by Hans Rosling, how women having, in the 50s, when they started to have washing machines, became suddenly hugely more productive. To my grandmother, the washing machine was a miracle. Washing clothes is a really unproductive task. It's just repetitive to keep doing it. You know, you're not creating anything that's sustaining anyone, really. It's just time wasted. So two billions have access to washing machine, and the remaining five billion, how do they wash? 
How do most of the women in the world wash? They wash like this, by hand. It's a time-consuming labor, hours every week. And sometimes they also have to bring water from far away. And they want the washing machine. And there's nothing different in their wish than it was for my grandma. Two generations ago in Sweden, water from the stream, heating with firewood, washing like that. They want the washing machine in exactly the same way. But environmentally concerned students tell me, no, everybody in the world cannot have cars and washing machines. How many of you doesn't use a car? And some of them proudly raise their hand, you know, and say, I don't use a car. And then I put the really tough question. How many of you hand wash your jeans and your bed sheet? And no one raised their hand. As soon as you could get a machine to do that for you, that time became time for the family. And he said that was when he sat down with his mum and started to learn to read with her. And that would happen multiplied over. All these women suddenly have much more capacity for being more nurturing or being more productive. And it's a great empowerer to have energy and have machines do things for us that are just routine, rote tasks. Huge fractions of the developing world. Women spend all day looking for sources of water. And when they get to the water, it is typically filthy and parasites, disease, etc. I mean, if you could have clean water, uh, disease and parasite-free water to homes, you would liberate an enormous amount of time. And you'd increase the health of the people. Uh, there's a lot of things we just throw away because the energy to reuse them is more expensive than virgin material. Dig it out of the ground, you turn it into something, you use it, you smash it, and then you throw it back in a pit in the ground. Ultimately, it just means you leave one big hole in the ground over here and then start filling up another hole over there. And is that, is that sustainable, perhaps, as a, more of a closed-loop system that could be employed? And that's the dream, but that does require energy. That was one thing that always attracted me about the notion of exploring space, was that you had to implement that simply to survive. You know, if you were going to live on the moon or Mars, there was no pit over here and pit over there. You better figure out how to make it all stay. You know, every, every atom of nitrogen or oxygen or hydrogen became precious to you. And when I would tell people, why were we doing NASA? That was the most effective thing, was the whole idea of recycling and what we would learn from exploring space. What prevents us from doing that right now on Earth? I mean, why do we have to go to space to learn how to be really, really good recyclers? Why don't we recycle like that on Earth? It's energy, you know, energy has to be really, really cheap, or the penalty has to be really, really bad. Now, in space, the penalty was really, really bad. If you didn't recycle, you ran out of air and water. But on the ground, to go achieve that dream of a closed loop, you need to have really, really cheap energy. For example, in the copper mining space, when they extract the copper, they'll do a first pass and then leave it as a mound. And they'll wait until the price of copper goes high enough. But there's a price at which you can justify doing a second or even third or more passes and it's all a function of what's the energy input and what's the market price and when those reach parity you can go in and, and justify more extraction. Well the same is true with recycling these materials. If we can bring the cost of electricity down far enough you could conceivably even go back and, and recycle landfills. Appliances, uh, we chop up rail, old rail cars, uh, demolish bridges, buildings, um, whatever. We load scrap into large haul trucks and they back up into this bucket and dump scrap inside. That's dozens of cars. Yeah, a lot of cars. So that bucket probably has 140 tons of scrap in it right now. I told them if they saw anything go boom and run behind you, yeah. that's still the standard protocol. That's right, I got Kevlar on. Uh, you guys do the same, we're all getting behind you. You've been able to drop your power consumption per ton almost about a third, it looks like. Probably since the, uh, the mid, early 80s. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. How do you water use? We're evaporatively cooling. And we use about two and a half million gallons a day, so we're a pretty big water user which is about a tenth of what the paper mills use. But you can get far more cycles on recycling steel oh, or aluminum well, than you could out of paper or plastic. Oh, sure. Yeah, actually, it's debatable whether paper recycling is even that great a pursuit. In some cases, it's mandated, but this is one where economics drives the recycling. 
but the steel industry is probably one of the better models of recycling. Aluminum too would be, there's less given over to waste. If we could make energy cheap enough, there's a lot of other products you could Absolutely. make economic to recycle. Absolutely. It's easy to forget about that in our world here on Earth because we're so abstracted from our energy sources. Food is at the grocery store and that we flush the toilet and the waste goes somewhere where somebody takes care of them. And we don't really think about the, the flow of energy that makes all of this possible. With the energy generated, we can actually recycle all of the air, water, and waste products within the lunar community. In fact, doing so would be an absolute requirement for success. We could grow the crops needed to feed the members of the community even during the two-week lunar night using light and power from the reactor. It kind of was this microcosm that made it easier for me to understand the bigger picture that we do have going on here on Earth and how we can make that, that bigger picture better, how we can enhance our quality of life on Earth.